Hello there, fellow Battle Brothers, and welcome back to some more 40k lore. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video on the Mighty Phalanx, the mobile fortress monastery of the Imperial Fists. A lot of you seem to enjoy that video, and also a lot of you seem to think that you would enjoy a part 2. A tour of the phalanx, as I somewhat advertised it in that video. So today, before we move on to another section of Legion lore in the weeks to come, we shall go over some inside lore on the fortress itself. Unfortunately, these areas of the ship are obviously not known for their dedicated artworks, but I will do my best to give something appropriate anyway. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Living aboard the Mobile Fortress Monastery, it is easy to forget that the Phalanx is the size of a small moon. Even given the majestic dimensions of the chapels and the cathedrals, the Asimularum and the Scriptoriums, it is too easy for someone living on board to forget the sheer immensity of this place. When one stepped onto the departure bay, though, one is immediately reminded that not only this is a spaceborne vessel, but that the phalanx is immense on a scale that is difficult for a rational mind to comprehend. On the other side of the bay, so far away that the sight of it is hazed with the distance, were the bay doors that opened out onto the cold vacuum of the void, before which were arranged hundreds of Thunderhawk gunships, Imperial shuttles, and other such craft in their hundreds. Overhead, hanging from the rafters that were barely visible from the deck, hung decommissioned aircraft and spacefaring vessels of the chapter, preserved and displayed in honor of past victories, and of those who had fought and died on board them. It was said that the departure hall was so large that it developed its own microclimate, separate from the artificial environment which prevails throughout the rest of the Mobile Fortress Monastery. That there are some strains of avian life forms roosting up in the rafters and on board those ancient and honored craft hanging from them. And these are said to have evolved into entirely new forms and physiologies over the millennia, unseen by human eyes elsewhere. On a somewhat more human scale, although still towering over the Battle Brothers that walk beneath, were arranged on the walls the battle trophies of past victories and enormous murals depicting famous battles from the annals of the Legion and the Chapter. There were ancient weapons and early marks of power armor dating back all the way to the Great Crusade, preserved eternally and displayed there reverentially after age finally robbed them of their use, each one carrying a provenance as long and celebrated as that of the Chapter itself. Fluttering slightly in the pressure differential between the departure bay and the hatches leading to the corridors, there hung immense banners, each of them easily as wide as four Adeptus Astartes in full power armor standing abreast, and more than twice as tall. There was one of these for each of the battle companies of the Imperial Fists, each bearing the heraldry and litany of the company in question. Surmounting them all was an even bigger chapter banner, golden yellow and trimmed in jet black and blood red, on which was inscribed number 7, remembering the chapter's origins as the Emperor's Seventh Legion in the Great Crusade. Also the word Roma, referring to the Imperial Fist's earliest battle honor, which now existed only in a ceramite icon, which itself was considered too precious and valuable even to be put on display in the inner reclusium of the phalanx. Finally, the icon of the Black Fist grasping a red thunderbolt, beneath which was scrolled the legend, Sons of Dorne. There are several chapter banners, but only one of them was put on display at any given time, rotated out at regular intervals in recognition of important actions and significant victories. Throughout the phalanx, there were also multiple tribute galleries that displayed art, standards, and captured weapons evoking the long, glorious history of the Imperial Fists. The massive foredeck of this great vessel was able to accept large transport ships, including the High Lords of Terra's own ship, Potus Terrae, the equivalent in size of a light cruiser. The dock itself had a massive atrium covered in ornate panels and four large decorated docking corridors which allowed entrance into the ship. The concourse was huge, over a hundred meters high with a domed ceiling decorated with legion and chapter victories. 
a 30 meter wide diamond sat at the top of the dome, the walls holding beautiful reliefs, and the marble floor was further decorated with a mosaic of Imperial Fist's imagery. At the other end was a massive staircase leading to a kilometer long hall containing various trophies of conquest. Adjacent to the trophy hall was another corridor with a grand but smaller stairway and a corridor that contained damage from fighting during the War of the Beast. At the end of the smaller corridor was a hall for dining and a chamber surrounded by plain glass for meetings. The chamber held a black circular table and a finely crafted statue of a space marine in the center of the room. The foredeck of the phalanx was so large it could dock a dozen cruisers and had developed its own ecosystem complete with unique species of animal life. On board the phalanx and in the strike cruisers and bigger starships of the chapter can be found the so-called Arena Restricta, sacred holes hung with ancient and storied blades, temples dedicated to the worship of the sword. And upon that hallowed ground, battle brothers draw their weapons against one another, their feet secured in blocks of gleaming steel, while their brethren sit in solemn witness from above. The Astartes of the Imperial Fists duel to settle a dispute, to prove the strength of one proposition against its counter, or merely to test the mettle of one brother against another. And though the wounds inflicted in these honor duels are seldom fatal, it is rare to find an Imperial Fist of long years who doesn't bear somewhere on him the badges of honor won in the Arena Restricta. The area called the Sigismunda Tactica was one of the hearts of the Phalanx. It spanned the barracks deck and was a kilometer and a half wide. The Forge of Ages was anchored on one end, beyond which lay a tangle of engineering areas and power and coolant conduits. The other flank of this large area terminated in the Rin's World Memorial, an amphitheater of granite inscribed in the names of the Crimson Fists that were lost in the nigh-on destruction of their fortress monastery by the orcs. A large carved stone tableau contained carved battle scenes from the Rin's World Campaign. On the other hand, the Observatory was one of the Phalanx's many follies, a viewing dome built as a throw room for past chapter masters, where the transparent dome afforded a dramatic enough view of space to intimidate the chapter guests who came here to petition the Lords of the Imperial Fists. Former Imperial Fist chapter master Vladimir Pew had little need of such shows of intimidation and kept the observatory closed for years. The Phalanx also possessed a large librarium, containing the accumulated knowledge dating back all the way to the Great Crusade. These vast repositories of knowledge were maintained by the ship Archivists, a rather curious breed even by the standards of the Voidborn. Many of these had been born on the ship, the few that were not had been purchased in childhood as chapter serfs to serve as apprentices to the aged chapter functionaries. An archivist's purpose was to maintain the enormous parchment scrolls on which the deeds and histories of the chapter were recorded. These massive rolls, some three times the height of a man and twice as broad, hung on their rollers from the walls of the cylindrical archive shaft, giving it the appearance of the inside of an insect hive bulging with pale cells. An archivist was not really a person at all, but a human-shaped shadow tolerated to exist only as far as their duties allowed. They schooled their apprentices in the art of abandoning one's own personality. Some archivists would write on the fresh surfaces of recently installed parchment scrolls, their nimble fingers noting down the transitions in delicate longhand. Others would be illuminating the borders and capital letters. The phalanx had been designed whenever that was, before the age of the Imperium, to survive. Any hostiles who boarded the immense ship might find themselves trapped in the tight winding corridors of the engineering and maintenance areas just beneath the hull of the ship, separated from the vast ship's more vulnerable areas by hundreds of automated bulkhead doors and entire sections of outer deck that could be vented into hard vacuum at any time. A little-known area of the phalanx lays deep in the bowels of the fortress. Known as the Panpsychicon, it was an unusual experiment that was laid dormant for two centuries. The circular expanse of the Panpsychicon was bounded by smooth walls inlaid with mosaic. The names of a hundred great battles from the Imperial Fist history were depicted there in patterns of brightly colored stone shards, surrounded by complex heraldries spiraling into an unbroken pattern. 
even the name Terra was picked among the heraldry. Commemorating the part that the Imperial Fist had played in the Battle of the Emperor's Palace 10,000 years earlier at the Siege of Terra. In the center of this panpsychicon was a device of steel and crystal reaching the ceiling, something like a set of interlocking spider webs in which were suspended slabs and chunks of crystal like giant gemstones. A rainbow of colors reflected from every surface, crafting a maddening nest of shapes and light that refused any attempt to view it as a normal object in three dimensions. There were manacles set into the floor, one of dozens set in concentric circles around the central device. Some enemies of the Imperium resisted traditional interrogation techniques, particularly psychers among them, and the Panpsychicon was built to rid them of their mental barriers. It was a machine constructed to grind down men's souls. Only the Inquisition made use of such devices, but with varying degrees of success, and never before had been one built on such a scale. The Panpsychicon would become a relic of the past though, one rarely spoken of by the Imperial Fists themselves. Meanwhile, the Strategium is the command bridge of not only the Phalanx, but also the headquarters of the Imperial Fists chapter fleet. This contains the Hand of Dorn, supposedly the last remaining portion of the body of the Primarch, which members of the chapter renewed their vows before. The whole Martialis was the location of the vessel where aspirants seeking to join the chapter were gathered and trained. The Temple of Oves was an imperial shrine deep in the fortress. This used to be the spiritual heart of the Legion, but nowadays it is sealed, for those that were once permitted to walk its halls without leave from Rogel Dorn are long dead. The Cloister of Remembrance is another imperial shrine kept aboard the Phalanx, and the closest current equivalent for the chapter to the Temple of Oves. It is here that captured trophies and battle honors are kept, and where captains of the chapter renew their oaths. Finally, the Scriptum Ascenda is another archive of the chapter aboard the Phalanx. It contains commentaries by Rogel Dorn on the events of the Great Crusade and the Heresy, and the texts are said to be shockingly blunt and matter-of-fact in their manner. Over time, however, and unfortunately, the archive has become damaged and decayed, and today what were originally great military schema and predictions on the future are now reduced to garbled prophecy. Even worse, during the 13th Black Crusade, when the Phalanx went to Cadia, the Scriptum Ascenda was badly damaged. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you about the halls and other significant locations aboard the mighty Phalanx for today. Even though there's a good chunk of lore on these sections of the ship, I somehow still find myself interested in it even more. Now, concerning future Legion videos for our regular Saturdays, I think I'm gonna be doing a mix of episodes on Legion homeworlds and Legion flagships maybe. So that, even if we have Legions with little homeworld lore, maybe they have more fleet lore, or vice versa. That way, nobody's gonna be left out. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on today's topic in the comments below if you want. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you all a healthy and awesome day. The Emperor protects.